Hi, and welcome again to my Physics Online video lecture series. Today's video, I'm going to be talking a bit about Hooke's Law. Um, specifically, I'm going to be talking um, both about Hooke's Law as the force, um, uh, as governing the force applied by an ideal spring, and maybe a little bit about modifications to that ideal spring situation. Uh, this is a topic that is often covered in both Physics 1 and in Physics 2. I'm going to focus on the forces side of Hooke's Law, uh, which is necessary for both. And uh, let's, let's get into it. <clears throat> okay, so an ideal spring is uh, such that if you leave it alone. It has some particular length. And if you, say, fix one end and then attach the other end to some amount of weight, the spring will tend to stretch out like this. So we have m times g here, uh, and there is some amount of stretch delta x uh, between the unstretched and the stretched. And if we were to apply double the amount of weight to this system, see if I can actually draw it with double the amount. So this is now with 2 times m times g. Our new stretch um, becomes twice as big 2 delta x, um, let's call this delta x1, this could be delta x2, or delta x1, excuse me. Um, the force being applied by the spring in both cases must be the weight, or equal to the weight attached to the end. And so this force, um, the amount of weight has doubled, the amount of stretch has doubled, we expect this force to be proportional to the amount by which the spring is stretched. And by the way, this works also for compression. So if you have a spring uh, that is fixed onto the ground and oriented vertically, and you were to put some weight onto it, um, or if you were to put twice as much weight onto it, then you'd expect it to compress proportional to the amount of weight. So this also could represent the delta x, and this also could represent um, 2 delta x. So either way, the force is proportional to delta x. And it doesn't just happen when you double the weight. If you were to make a complete plot of force uh, versus stretch for this spring, and I'm going to allow it to stretch or compress, so this might be um, a stretch. This might be the amount of force that the spring is applying. And what you would end up getting is basically straight line like this. And so you could say essentially that the force is equal to negative of some constant value times delta x. So this is the force applied by the spring. This is the uh, displacement of the end of the spring, uh, which is not fixed, uh, with the other end being, of course, fixed. And k, uh, the slope of this line, slope equals negative ks. This is what's called spring force constant, or sometimes spring constant. Uh, and this equation, f equals negative kx, or k delta x, this is what is called Hooke's Law. So this is Hooke's law. Uh, 
And if we want to be really formal here, these are both vector terms, which is why there's that negative sign present. Um, the force not only is proportional to the displacement, but is in the opposite direction to the displacement. This is sometimes referred to as a restoring force, which is important when we talk about oscillations um, for what it's worth. Okay, so that is Hooke's Law. Um, one caveat. Very often, if you go to a real-life spring uh, in a lab, for example, you'll find that the graph doesn't actually quite look like the one that I drew. Uh, what actually ends up happening for a real-life spring, and I'm just going to do magnitude here, and I'm just going to stretch it. So magnitude, no direction shown here. Delta x, this would be the stretch. Let's say that the spring can't really compress further because it's already tightly wound. Uh, what will tend to happen is you can place certain masses onto the spring and it doesn't really stretch or it doesn't really stretch noticeably. And then it's sort of like after a certain amount of mass the spring suddenly behaves in a linear manner. Okay, so this is really a non-ideal spring, um, but we can still write for this region right here, and maybe I should highlight it uh, actually in red, let's say, or green. For this region in here, we still have linear relationship, so linear, and so we can still write basically Hooke's law, F equals K delta X, or KS delta X. It's just that now we have an additional parameter, which I'm going to call F naught. F naught is essentially where this line intersects with the force axis, the y-axis. Okay, and so Hooke's Law still does a pretty good job. We just have to add an additional um, offset. And then anything below f naught, the stretch is just zero. There's no stretch or there's nearly no stretch. Okay, so that's caveat number one. Caveat number two. What happens if we have more than one spring? So in this scenario, what if we have two springs which are identical? And how they behave is going to kind of de uh, depend upon how they're connected. So this right here we would call like a series connection uh, of the two springs. And one that's more like this, this would be called a parallel connection. So these are in parallel. And now imagine this is fixed, this is fixed. Now imagine putting some weight on the end and imagine putting the same amount of weight on the end up here. So how does each spring behave? Well, assuming ideal springs, um, one, one property of ideal springs is that the mass is negligible for the spring itself. And so I've a, I've a put, let's say, mg down here. And that means that this spring has to essentially apply mg upward on this spring plus mass. And this spring also has to apply mg upward on this mass. And so both, string, uh, both springs stretch by delta x. Um, so let's write that here. Both springs stretch by delta x. That's each. 
And so total 2 delta x total stretch. But for the same amount of force as what we had over here with 1 mg on this spring. And so if we have the same amount of force but double the stretch, coming back to this graph, that would be like having double the run for the same rise. And so that's half as much slope. Remember, slope is rise over run. And so effectively, your total um, spring constant, your equivalent spring constant, is half of either one's individual constant. So if this one has spring constant k, this one has spring constant k, I could replace this pair with a new spring that has a spring constant one half of k. Now we come over here and we do the same thing and we say, okay, well, what if I place mg um, on the end of these two springs. Again, this one has k, this one has k. Well, each spring is holding up half of mg. So I have half as much force for each of these two springs as I would have before, which means that each one should stretch by half as much. But the, the total force held up is still a full mg. So if I were to replace these with an equivalent spring, it has half as much stretch for the same amount of weight. And so that's like having half the run for the same rise. That's like having two times as much uh, slope. Now the generalization of this, uh, generalization, ties into what's called stress and strain. So if you're in Physics 1, you probably haven't learned about stress and strain yet. In Physics 2, you should already know about these. Um, you're looking at the Young's modulus of elasticity. And effectively, your spring constant for either spring is the cross-section area of the spring times the Young's modulus of elasticity divided by the equilibrium length of the spring. So your equilibrium length of the spring uh, would be basically just this distance here uh, where it is not stretched at all. Okay, so this is spring's constant in terms of Young's modulus. The consequence of this for what it's worth, and this generalizes these two equations, is in series 1 over the equivalent spring constant is equal to the sum of all of the reciprocals of the individual spring constants. And in parallel, the total equivalent spring constant is equal to the sum of the individual spring constants. The J in these cases is just a um, index, okay? So you could write this one if you have like, let's say four springs, you'd have one over K equivalent is equal to one over K1 plus one over K2 plus one over K3 plus 1 over k4, um, or ks1, ks2, ks3, ks4. And down here, in parallel, k equivalent is equal to ks1 plus ks2 plus ks3 plus ks4. Now notice, when you put them in series, the length of the total gets longer, but in parallel, the effective area gets bigger. So this also matches with this equation.